band walk is a traditional exercise that is prescribed to improve hip abduction weakness. However, in this video, I really want to change your perspective and show you how to perform it better when you actually execute it and how to coach it better, but also how to use it as a means to improve hip internal rotation. So in this video, we're going to look at our assessments, our asymmetries of the body, and then really go into a better way to coach band walks and then how we can specifically modify it to improve hip internal rotation measurements. So I want to take a step back for a second and really look at the source that led us to actually prescribing the band walk in the first place. The source should be your assessment. When the assessment is performed and ran through correctly, it can literally tell you everything that you need to know for exercise prescription and programming. So if we are in fact prescribing a band walk for a patient or client, why? How did you come to that? How are you going to have them perform that, right? Your assessment tells you. However, I feel like a lot of us do a poor job bringing through and carrying through the assessment into our exercise prescription and really our exercise execution, right? How we're actually executing the exercise and performing it, coaching it, which cues we're using, all of those things. So let's step back for a second and understand our assessment. We need to understand that the body, the human body has an inherent asymmetry. And that asymmetry exists and at the pelvis, it will show in a way that we are in a slight turn towards the right. Now, whether you realize this asymmetry or not, I want to tell you that you probably already do. The problem is we just look at it from the, uh, the wrong perspective. How many of you have checked range of motion of the hip and the femurs and noticed that maybe there's an asymmetry? One side has more ER, one side has more IR. We typically chalk that off as normal or tight muscles, but I, what I want you to do is, is think a little more. Understand that the appendicular system is telling you how the axial skeleton is turning or laying. Most of us are slightly turning. So if we run into a situation where we notice that we are in this right turn, it typically presents as being in more of an IR position on the right and an ER position on the left. As that will show to you as you look at range of motion is in an increase in ER on the left, if we go here, more ER, more IR on the right. Now, I'm not saying that is going to, going to be true for every single person, but what I want you to do is to start to increase your awareness and understand, are you seeing this? But then if you are, are you then going and prescribing bilateral exercise? For instance, the typical band walk is usually done on both sides. Why do we do that? We just saw during our assessment that there's an asymmetry that one side has way more ER compared to the other. So why are we wasting our time going through the hip abduction or ER based strategy on both sides? One side probably only needs it. So what I want you to do is increase your awareness on really bringing forward your assessment findings. Your assessment findings will tell you your exercise prescription that exercise prescription should then be coached in a very specific manner based off your patient's results, movement capabilities, limitations, restrictions, all of that. So that's the first thing. Now, as I talked about, we're really going to look to improve hip IR strategies during the band walk. And I like substituting the traditional band walk or hip abduction measures for more of the IR side because I find that there are three main compensations that happen with a traditional band walk that really make the exercise not worth doing. So the first we already talked about a little bit, that is performing the hip abduction or band walks bilaterally. 
we already talked about your assessment showed one thing, then you go and prescribe it bilaterally. Is that the best use of your time? Maybe, maybe not. But remember, in the physical therapy world, you typically don't have a lot of time with your patients. So everything you need to do and prescribe and coach needs to be done with intention and purpose so that you can give them back the most value and back the most quality of life that they are looking to return to, right? So the first thing is understanding that unilateral exercise is okay. The second problem that typically happens with a band walk is that it's normally performed very poorly. There's a lot of compensations. We have trunk leans, we have momentum through the spine, we have hips moving in ways that we don't want them to. So to me, if I wanna improve hip abduction or external rotation measures, I think there's better exercises that can do that with decreasing the amount of compensations that occur. The last compensation and problem with the typical band walk is that essentially it plays off of what we just talked about is that we tend to have really low standards with this exercise. What I have found is that it really turns into an exercise that it turns into a warm-up for a lot of people. The therapist or the coach doesn't really watch it. It's, it's typically performed wrong with momentum like we talked about. So we go through the motions with this exercise. So I really strive and encourage you to raise your standards and have higher movement standards during this exercise. And what you'll find is that shifting this towards more of a IR bias will do a lot of that for you. So now that we kind of understand the assessment and the three main problems of the band walk, let's go over what a typical band walk biomechanically looks like. And then we'll go into how to coach and perform the IR biased band walk. So we briefly talked about our asymmetry where we have right IR and left ER. Now we need to understand that the typical band walk is a very femoral or femur driven exercise, right? The femur is moving on the pelvis or the femur is moving on the acetabulum. What I want you to start to shift towards is actually moving this to a exercise that has more of a pelvis bias. And once we do that, that's when we can, when we can really start to drive IR mechanics. So you'll use your assessment findings, but for our example, where we have left IR limitations, we are gonna demonstrate and show you how to get more of that turn towards the left. That turn towards the left is really gonna to start to address the left IR biases. Now again, we already touched upon this, but we're not going to do it on the right. Why? Because typically, or based off our example, we already have right IR. We need to work on left IR, right? What we don't typically have on the right is ER. So maybe a traditional band walk would be great, or another ER or abduction-based exercise on the right would work. But we are really going to start to move this towards more of a pelvis driven exercise compared to a femur driven exercise. So we're going to be able to use three simple cues that teach your patient how to move into internal rotation that will give them IR that they don't have. Can't get better than that, right? So step, shift, lift. Those are going to be the three keys that you need to know. And I want to break down what they each mean and what we need to look for and then you can see me doing it as I'm talking. So the first one's pretty easy, we're stepping. What you really wanna think about is as you step, we're stepping about an inch or two outside shoulder width, right? So it doesn't need to be a huge step, but we need a decent step. Now from there, they need to shift. Now, you may need to break down a shift so that your patient or client can perform it. A lot of times what people do is when they shift, they just shift their thorax over or they just shift their hip over. Ideally, we need to stay in a nice straight line. So when you go, you truly offload the limb that you're looking to unload. How do we do that? We can cue nose over toe. When you shift nose over toe, you'll start to see that the whole body moves more as a unit over to that left side. What you can also use is the glute. As you shift over, you should start to get 
more glued activation. So you can ask your patient or client where they're feeling. That also is going to give you a representation as to where they are on their foot, right? If they are too toe dominant, they probably won't feel their glute. What you really need to do to get that glute is we need more IR based strategies, right? So we're gonna need a medial heel. We're gonna need the lateral heel, but more kind of biased on that medial heel. And then we need the big toe down. So you can't lose that natural foot tripod, but you may have to bias an emphasis more of a medial heel pressure with that big toe staying down. That will drive slightly more amount of pronation or IR based measures. So then we can find the glute. So again, we're stepping outside of shoulder width. We're then shifting with our whole body weight over there, right? Really making sure that the whole body weight is over there. And if it's done correct, they will feel their glutes and it, it won't be a guessing game. They should be very confident that they feel their glute. Now, when we shift, we are then adding in our arms. The arms are going to help bring out this IR strategy. As we turn, the left arm in this scenario is gonna go straight back. And then we're thinking about the right elbow going and in line with the left knee. What is that gonna do? That's gonna take this pelvis and it's going to drive that nice IR that we are looking to achieve, okay? So we're using the arms and the thorax and it's really nice because what you'll find is a lot of times with this, you will get improvements at the pelvis but a lot of improvements at the shoulder as well because we are really putting this out as a full body exercise. So we have that left arm going back, we have the trunk turning, that's all promoting IR based strategies on the left. Now we get to the lift component. The lift is a lot harder than it looks. What you're gonna wanna do is you first need to make sure that your patient or client has the capability to shift over and to turn, use their arms to turn, have their pelvis turn into left IR and, and feel the appropriate muscles. So we kinda are going for that left glute, left back, back pocket, high hamstring, low glute. If they can do that, then we're gonna lift. When we are cueing them to lift, we need to cue them in a way that to, they need to pretend that they're stepping over something because what we're trying to do is drive IR stability. The two things that often happen is when your patient or client goes to lift, they're either going to kick out towards the right because they don't have that range that they're in or stability, or they're going to stand, right? Because we're in a little bit of a squatty position. We need to maintain that position. We're not looking to elevate or stand or squat lower, right? That'd be more of a that quad dominant compensation. They need to just maintain. And it's really hard. When you lift that leg, you're trying to see minimal to no motion. We are maintaining our IR based strategy. We are holding on to the, the stability and strength that we're working on. And then they're going to take their foot up and over and then they can repeat. When you are cueing to lift, I encourage you to start with a heel raise so they can start to feel what it actually feels like with decreasing the amount of weight on their right leg. And then when they come and finally lift the toe, it's very slow, right? We're not dragging the leg, we're lifting it up and we're doing it in a very slow controlled manner. So that's what it really comes down to. Our step shift lift, we're using the thorax, we're using our coaching cues, we're using breathing, right? We can inhale on the way back there, exhale as you bring your leg up, but we're using all these strategies to improve hip IR. And again, it's in a way that is very much a higher standards of movement in a very specific and purposeful way so that we can get exactly what our assessment told us.